moved west of Indus, we, we began with one of world's largest urban empire, which was the Persian Empire. So today we come to an empire which just sits next to the Persian Empire, and somehow its archaeological origins go back to a very ancient period of antiquity, you know, something like 3500 BC or 4000 BC or even earlier. So in that sense, uh, this portion of ancient civilization, which is uh, lying in an area what we call Iran, Western Iran and Iraq today, is something like a cradle of um, modern Western civilization because the three religions started from this region. There's a slide right after this. And I think I've, I've shown that slide in preceding things when I discussed Islam a bit. So uh, this is a, a pretty complex civilization. And uh, if you can see my cursor, can you see my cursor, by the way, Shivangi, Anurag? Mm. Not yet, no? Not you can't yet. see my cursor. OK. But you can see the slide and my voice is audible, huh? Fine. Yes, yeah. sir. Yes. OK. So if you can see uh, the blue dots, it's mostly the different spots of. Can you all see the blue dots? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. So the blue dots are mostly the the Sumerian and the Mesopotamian civilizations. By Sumerian, we mean the early phase. The next subsequent phase, the subsequent phase is Mesopotamian, and finally it's Babylonian. So all that it's more towards the southeast. The coming close uh, what, to what we call the Persian Gulf, the Persian Gulf. Uh, today, what we mostly know as Middle East, you know, Iran, Iraq, uh, Qatar, Doha, Dubai, United Arab Emirates, which is Dubai. You know. So they all form a ring around the Persian Gulf. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the same place is today a, a place of heated and a uh, you know, very extreme geopolitical tension. You all know what's going on in Afghanistan and yesterday there was a massive anarchy and a mayhem in Kabul airport. So it's because there is a lot of uh, unsettled, unsolved issues in this region, mostly religious and aggravated by geopolitical re re reasons. So that's a background. Probably will come to that a little bit towards the end. So the blue dots are mostly an extended portion of the two rivers which comes out, which will be visible in the next few slides. One is Tigris and the other is Euphrates. And uh, if you come a little towards northwest, there is an upper half or an upper crown of this civilization, and that's called the uh, civilization of Ashur or what you call Assyria, Assyrian civilization, Assyrian civilization. And then these uh, blue dots finally head towards Turkey and they form the early civilizations of the Hittites or what you call the Syro Hittites. So Syro Hittites. And finally, and finally, that is an area which is uh, almost the precursor to the beginning of Greek civilization, what you call the pre Olympian or Asiatic Greek civilization. So we'll discuss that maybe in two or three periods when we move on to that place. And on towards the on towards the southwest, uh, there is a connection with this civilization that we're going to talk about today, with Africa, you know, via the Suez Canal, you know, so crossing the Red Sea. So this is the Red Sea, and that is the Egyptian civilization. You know, that is a famous story of crossing the Red Sea and reaching uh, the southwestern half of what you call the Fertile Crescent. You know which is the coastal region uh, between Turkey and Africa and Egypt, Egypt. So that portion is called the Fertile Crescent. That is where uh, the first settlements were coming on the western extreme origin, uh, coming from the eastern corners of the Persian Gulf. So between the eastern corners of the Persian Gulf, which is in this valley civilization and the western corners of the fertile crescent, you know, countries like Lebanon, you know, its capital Beirut and others all here, Syria, Jordan, uh, somewhere in between sits what we are going to discuss today. That is 
Sumer, the more earlier phase of civilization, and that got transform, transformed to a, a later phase of civilization, which is Mesopotamian, and it refined, uh, emerged, and also degraded to what we call the Babylonian civilization. So that's the southern eastern crown, which is complemented by a northwestern crown, which is the Assyrian civilization or centered around the city of Ashur. So Ashur is the ancient god uh, that we discussed briefly last class that's shared between Iran, Persia and this and this ancient Sumerians and the Assyrians from from a time of very remote antiquity. So the picture that you see on the top left is uh, a glimpse of uh, the more asymmetrical build forms, the architectural build forms along the river Euphrates. Uh, so these are some of the ancient temples which were built on the on the, on raised mounds, you know, to avoid the flooding of the river. And uh, and finally, on top of that, there is a podium, and on top of the podium, there's a terrace, and finally, on top of the terrace, you have the structures which were sacred structures and also used for residential quarters of priests and other kind of people who are associated with the temple worship. So this is the kind of architecture which looked a little asymmetrical, a little organic, a little sporadic and dispersed. So they come from the most ancient phase, what we call Sumeria. As a few thousand years had passed, that means as we move from a period of 4000 BC to about 3000 or 2500 BC, uh, the civilization in this part of the world consolidated. It became more strict, structured, more stronger geopolitical society emerged, and uh, we came to um, more structured civilizations of what we call Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia. So Shivangi, can you just check and tell me how many people are he here right now? It's almost sir, eight. Sir, 32. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty good. We have crossed 30. So, so the middle picture on the top, it's about uh, uh, a more matured phase of the civilization, which is Mesopotamia. The, the Greeks called this area as Mesopodam. So Podam uh, in ancient Greek language meant the river and Meso means Mazo, uh, uh, which means middle, you know, middle, Mazo, or Madho, Madho or Mazo. So the land between the two rivers is uh, the name of this place. And then over time, if you come to times of about 2000 BC or even a little later, 1500 BC, these are more visible times. Then the, the complexity of the civilization grows and the people who are coming to the civilization, that also increases the, the trade and commerce with the settlements and the various built form within the settlements also intensifies and develops a very complex structure. And uh, this civilization more prominently comes to be uh, it come to be it comes to be known as the civilization of the land of Babel. You know, so it is from the word Babel, uh, the word Bible or Biblos has emerged. So this is actually the city of Babel which in the ancient times was known as Babylon. Uh, so today what, what is known as Baghdad was actually known as Babylon in the past. And about a few thousand years back, it was known as Ur. So if I put it one after another, Ur, uh, Ur, Ur, Babylon, and then Baghdad, you know, Baghdad. So these are like the three phases. So in the Sumerian times, this was known as Ur. In the Mesopotamian and Assyrian times, late Assyrian times, it was known as Babylon. And finally, in the recent times after the birth of Christ, it is mostly known as uh, it is mostly known as uh, Baghdad. You know, so Baghdad became a very important city about uh, six, seven, or eight hundred years after the birth of Christ, with the advent of Islam, and it became a global civilization. And that is how. With the patronage of the court of Baghdad, Islamic civilization with the Arabian culture and a more uh, complex and more richer Persian culture had spread to different parts of the world. I think we have discussed all that when we had discussed Islam, Islamic architecture. 
last class. So some of those discussions are related to what we are discussing today. But today in this class, we have started from a more ancient pre-Islamic period of this time. So this is uh, uh, the, the acquaintance of the Pariche, uh, you know, the whole feature of this civilization. So I'm moving on to the next slide. Can someone read the top line? Anyone in the class? Sir, right now uh, the first slide is there only. Oh my goodness. So the slide hasn't changed, sir. That means there is a net. Yes, sir. Now, now it, now it. Changes. Yes, sir. Now, yeah. now it changes. So I think I have to. Otherwise, I'll go to a slide tray, and I'll show you it from the slide tray. Tell me if you, if you have recurringly facing problems, we'll do that. So this is a continental physiographic sir, scale. Again, we are on so we have slide one. The, yes, now it's okay, sir. Thank you. Oh my goodness, why is why is it happening? Oh, I think because I went back and came, so I think it's a late memory. OK, so now you are on continental physiographic scape. Yes, sir. OK, so this is about a more ancient picture. So on the top left, uh, can you see that map with the red dot? Yes, sir. Hello. Yes, okay. sir. So that is where we are today. And uh, and and the map in the bottom middle is something that I showed in the previous slide. So on the right we have the Indus Valley civilization. Uh, on the on the left we have the Mesopotamian civilization. And uh, if you if you look at this pictures on the left column, uh, in the middle left column we have a very large civilizational scape, what we call the Central Turan or the Mongoloid civilization. So believe it or not, I think we discussed this a little bit in a different class. So the Mongoloid civilization is the civilization of Tartary. So I don't know how many of you have a familiar with English literature. You know, the the, the poem called the Tartary by Walter de la Mare. Is there anyone in the class who has read that poetry, that poem? Walter de la Mare's Tartary, Tartary. Anyone in the class? Hello? Hello. Yes, sir, you are audible, sir. Oh, but there is no one who has read this poem. Fine, because these days we uh, don't read this kind of poems. So anyway, so in this, there is a whole description from Eastern Asia to about Western Asia into Europe. Uh, the land connections, the, the trade routes between China, Mongolia and Southern Korea through lower Russia, north of Tibet, through Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, up to Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and then entering Europe and Greece. So these in the modern terms are known as the Silk Route, but ethnically, anthropologically, culturally, these are known as the Tartary Routes, the Tartary Routes. So these routes were followed by uh, the great invaders, you know, like uh, uh, like Attila the Hun, or, uh, or uh, you know, or Taimul Lam, you know, who is known as Tamil and and uh, and different other peoples who had invaded Europe in different points of time, you know. So the Tartary connections are very important, and some of the Tartary connections have played a very important role in, in the formations of these civilizations. You know, like in the Indus Valley civilization, we have uh, we have found out the bust of the priest who looks like a person from Mongoloid. Even the Indus Valley script looks like a script from North, from the Asia Pacific or from East Asia. OK, so this is, I think, uh, a point to be remembered because the influence of Central Northern Asia from the East to the West plays a very important role. And this is called Turan. The whole area, this blue patch that you see in the top left is known as Turan. It's known as Turan. So much of the Iranian Khorasan population actually comes from there. You know, that's why today the capital of Iran is known as Tehran. The word Tehran comes from this entire ancient word, which is known as Turan, which is known as Turan. And uh, even the Mung even the, the Mughals who came to India, I think we had discussed that last class, last semester in Islamic architecture. They are also an extended people of this uh, zone, which is who are the Mongols, you know, Babur, Humayun, 
you know, all of them, Akbar, Jahangir, Shah Jahan, you know, they are all one after another, an extension of the race. Because the pictures that we have of these Indian Mughal empires symbolizes or depicts uh, uh, a lot of strong Sino-Mongoloid or Tata mongoloid features. So it shows there are a lot of strong interactions. You know, even in, in my family, for example, my mother had very strong Mongoloid features. My sister also has that. I don't have that much, but uh, there's a portion of my family who has these connections from northeast of India. If you go to northeast of India, the Mongolite features become more and more predominant. And then finally you enter China, they're absolutely Mongolite. And if you go to the entire Southeast Asia from Singapore to Asia Pacific, Japan, they're all Mongolite. And they, if you cross the Bering Strait, Kamchatka, and then you enter the American ancient past, the Red Indians, you know, the, the Hopis, the Pablos, the Mayans, the Incas, you know, uh, they are all Red Indians. So it has been proved that at a very ancient point of time, about a few 10,000, 20,000 years prior, prior to the birth of Christ, from the land of Tartary, people had actually migrated from Asia into the Americas. So hunt, about 25,000 years prior to Columbus, people had already reached America, and there they are something, what we call the Red Indians, you know, the Apaches, the Hopis, you know, the Incas, and so on and so on. So this is a point that needs to be remembered. Uh, and normally in our discussion on civilization, we missed this point. What I mean is, in other words, the eastern half of this continental physiographic scape. So even in the formation of the, the Sumerian, Babylonian, Assyrian civilizations, this northern half played a very important role. So these are some of the books that you see on the right hand side, you know, books on Tartary, you know, books by great scholars like Alexander David Neal, you know, she is a French historian, archaeologist, anthropologist, and she discovered some of these things and the shamanistic religion that exists all around, you know, even a portion of Indian religion, uh, uh, the Vedas, a, a portion of Persian religion, which is Zarathustra, a portion of early Judaism, they're all considered to be shamanistic. Now, shamanistic is the religion, the loose natural religion, nature worship of the people of Siberia. So these are things that we need to remember and they're very important. So now I'm moving on to the next slide and you tell me, this is a slide that I've already shown you before. So Shivangi, slide change, why? A global no, large sir, not religious, yet. Not yet. Okay. Yeah, it's there, sir. Okay, so it's, it's about it's... five seconds. Lag. Yeah, it's about five seconds lag. Yeah. So I think I'll tell that I'm changing the slide. So this is a slide which I've shown you last semester. And so we are talking about a, a civilization which was the beginning of world's three largest religion, Judaism, the oldest, followed by a fulfillment on the Western side which is Christianity and a fulfillment on the Eastern side, which is Islam. I think we have discussed a lot about this slide in preceding classes. So, but today we are discussing about the Sumerian civilization and the Sumerian civilization was the geographical scape where the patriarchal religion of Prophet Abraham, Prophet Abraham was born. And the two wives of Abraham, that is uh, Hajar and Sarah, gave birth to Ishmael and his Isaac. Uh, that gave to the lineage of Christianity and Islam. No, I'm sorry, Islam and Christianity in the next one few thousand years or so. So Sumerian, Babylonian, Sumerian, Assyrian or Sumerian Mesopotamian civilization is the causal basis of the foundation of three Asiatic religions, mind it three Asiatic religions, you know, the star of David, the cross and the crescent and the star Venus. But they be, they finally influenced the whole of Western civilization, you know, the whole of Europe and finally American civilization. But their origins are actually in Asia. The origins are actually in Asia. So this is a point which is undeniable. There is a 
there is a definite move of civilization, religion and culture from the east to the west. It is absolutely undeniable. The overall broad arrow, the overall broad arrow is always from the east to the west. You know, there could be migrations from the west to the east. There could be other migrations from the east to the west, but the overall predominant arrow is from the east to the west. It's always true. And that is how the sunlight is moving. And that is how the civilization has also moved, moved over time. So this is something which is very, very interesting to note. So with this point, I move on to the next slide. You tell me when you can see the next slide. It's called the Ubaid Sumerian systems. Tell me when it's visible. Yes, sir, it's there. OK, good. So can you read the two other lines? Anyone in the class, Reyesh or Bakul or Anurag? Mesopotamian cities or Babylonian cities? cities yeah, so this is exactly what I told you. Uh, so if you look at the built form, if you look at the city planning scape, now if you look at the distributions of uh, land use function over time, if you look at the various build forms which are attributing to the making of the civilization, if you move in this slide from the pictures in the top left to the pictures in the bottom right, there is a basic thing that happens. What is that? Anyone can say that if I move from the top left to the bottom right, there is an average change in, in the build forms and the cityscapes that we see. What is that change? Can anyone react or give an idea? Hello. More organized. Yeah, it is becoming more organized. Exactly. It is becoming more structured. It is becoming more complex. And it is becoming more urbanized. That means more settlements are happening. It is becoming a bigger urban system or various urban systems coming together. So when you look at that picture on the top left, that is of very ancient cities, and you can see that it looked like these are, of course, artist renditions uh, of archaeological sites. They look like less dense, more open and very natural kind of things. Whereas if you come to the, the bottom uh, right, most slide, which is a famous Ishtar gate in Babylon. It looks like a military camp with very high walls and uh, very organized and structured and as if like the Romans, you know, some you can see some groups of people are marching from inside of the palatial city to the outside. And this is actually Babylon and you can see the green at various levels. So that's why from a distance, People used to see the green at various levels and when the buildings were not that visible, when the buildings were not that visible, uh, the green looked like floating in the sky, you know, something like the Avatar movie by James Cameron, you know, where you could see mountains and greens and rivers floating in the sky. So that's why in it is uh, there is a normal saying, hanging garden of Babylon. You know, Actually, they are not hanging. They are from a very higher level. So it is known as the Hanging Garden of Babylon. The other things uh, in build form, the changes that happens is that there's a general movement from more asymmetrically laid out building forms on the left to the more structured forms on the right, more structured forms on the right. Uh, the other observation is that uh, in the, the, the buildings that we see on the left, they are quite free, uh, they are quite organic and more complementary to the nature, whereas the tendencies to build uh, more structure and independent of nature and develop a built environment of your own becomes a tendency in Babylonian cities. You know, so this is something that we are even doing today in our cities. You know, we are where we are trying to create more artificial, concrete laid or stone laid or some other material laid uh, city systems and build forms. So the good so the good news is that 
by that the cities are becoming very complex. Uh, the built forms are becoming very large. You know, the complexity and the services and the utilities in the built form is becoming very huge. But the bad news is that by virtue of that, we are making the built forms and their envelopes and their totality more uh, high carbon. We are making it more impervious. We are making it less energy efficient, you know, probably consuming huge amount of electricity and air conditioning over the times and spaces. So this is something this is something that we need to understand that, that we need to understand as we move from the left to the right. You know. So in the left hand side, we have more in, inorganic general things. So probably the level of security and organization was not there, but life was very free and more with the nature and most of the urban forms were yet to emerge. It was semi rural, semi urban form. So there's a transitional change from earlier Ubaid. So Ubaid is the name of the earliest phase uh, of Sumerian society. Now there is a controversy here. Uh, some scholars say that the word Ubaid actually comes from the opposite and complementary nature of the word Baid. So the Indian civilization was a Baid or Baidik civilizations, whereas the Ubaid civilization was Ibadi or Abad or Ubaid or non Vedic civilization. So which which shows that at a very ancient point of the time, at a very ancient point of the time, the Persians, the Sumerians and Indians could be coming from a common stock and then they separated and then there were misunderstandings and understandings. And then after a few thousand years, they grew independently with different ideas. So as this slide says, there are three phases. Phases which are older than 3500 BC, that's Ubaid Sumerian. The middle band about 3000 BC, which is Mesopotamian, and anything which is later than 2000 BCE is Ur Babylonian cities. So that's about this slide. You know, that's about this slide. Let's move on to the next slide. Tell me when you can see this slide. Hello. So slide not yet. My goodness. Not changing. So now it's visible. It's not changing, huh? Okay. No, sir. It's visible now. Oh, it's visible. So it's coming pretty late. Okay. So what is written on this slide just to confirm? Assyrian cities. Yeah, so these are northwestern cities. So if you go, if you go up upstream in the river into the mountainous region of Syria, you know, and and uh, and eastern Turkey, that is where Assyria is. And there a complementary northern civilization had grown around these cities. And so you can see it from the map. You can see it from the map. So in the lower portion of the map, which is Babylonia, which is ancient Sumeria and Mesopotamia, you can see if, if you can read it, it's too small for you. If you can read the cities of Nippur, Sippur, Uruk and Ur. These were some of the ancient cities of Babylonia or Sumeria. The very interesting thing is that most of these cities end with a suffix called Ur, you know, something in India uh, we have Kanpur, Nagpur, you know, all these Poors, you know, and you know, Kharagpur. Yeah, that's really funny. So in the same way, some of the early Sumerian cities were also known as Nippur, Sippur, Ur, and all that thing. So these are, which shows that there was some connection with, with the Indian way of life. But if you go up, you can see the other cities of Nine Way and the most important city of Ashur. So here is an artist impression of the city of Ashur, an artist impression of the city of Ashur. And it, it looks like this was a pretty colossal and a very huge city. No. If I don't tell you that this is a Assyrian city, you'll probably think that this is also a Roman city. You know, probably the Romans have built this kind of a structure. 
So the Assyrian civilization had a lot of similarity with the beginnings of Roman. In fact, they were an extended part of the Persian civilization and they were also extended up to the Romans, up to the Romans. So this is something which is very, very important for us to understand. And you can see, you can look at the complex built forms. So this is about 2500 BC or so. And by this time, the Assyrian civilization had grown into a very complex city structure. So these are some of the town halls or the city hall buildings in the distance. You can see a ziggurat, which is a temple ritualistic building. In the foreground, you can see a huge building, which is about three or four storied, you know, or even bigger than that. And some of the some of the some of the forms represent the early forms of that Sumerian temple, which I showed you. But it is very striking that this kind of forms you even see today uh, built by the British in India, you know, the buildings in Madras presidency or in Kolkata, Dalhousie Square or in Connaught Place and Presidential Palace in Delhi or in Nariman Point or Victoria Terrace in Mumbai or Bombay. So it shows some of this most ancient architectural styles that originated in Iran, Persia, in Sumeria and, and in Assyria continued with Western architecture and continued till about 16th, 17th century. That's what we are going to discuss towards the, towards the end of this course. And it, be, at, and, it and it continued to influence Western architecture where and especially the Greco-Roman architecture, the architecture of Greece and Rome. So Renaissance, which happened around 14th, 15th century, was actually the revival of pre-Christian Greco-Roman elements. But actually, they were the revival of the origins of the Greco-Roman elements, which probably comes from Assyria, Persia, and Sumeria. This is a point to be remembered. You know, much of the building styles the elements of designs, the other forms actually originates from these built forms. You know, the eaves details, you know, the column, uh, the column styling all around the building, you know, the various architraves. Uh, I wish we are in a class and I could have sketched this because I cannot show it by the cursor. So all the horizontal lines that you see uh, uh, that are evident even in buildings that I see in Kolkata, you know, Writers building, AG, or that I see in Delhi, you know, in Connaught Place, you know, the buildings around Connaught Place, or that I see in Nariman Point, and, or on, you know, the Bombay Station, Victoria Terrace, VT Station, you know. So this, these are styles which have survived for about 3,000, 4,000 years. You know, I made a trip to Ann Arbor, University of Michigan. This was about four years back before COVID. And believe it or not, even some of the buildings that I saw in the American campus looked like buildings like these, you know, like these. So it showed that some of the Asiatic architectural styles went through Europe, crossed the Atlantic, and became the expression of the pre-Christian pagan architectural elements of Asia. And they are followed by the Freemasonics and the new builders in the United States of America, including Canada. You know, people like Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Benjamin Franklin. I mean, they're all the forefathers of the modern American civilizations, and they are extremely influenced by this ancient original Greco-Roman civilization order. So in this slide, there is a lot of story. It's not a pretty simple one, but that cuts across history. So I was audible to everyone. Did you all hear me? Yep. Yeah? Yes, sir. OK, good. So I think you have got it. I think it will become clearer and more clearer as we march on to uh, further classes. OK, so I am changing the slide and uh, but anyway, before changing the slide on the top right, you can see the the larger map uh, where where you can see that the fertile crescent, uh, which is uh, Beirut, Lebanon and the whole of Sumerian Assyrian civilization was actually connected with the Egyptian civilization. This was all one integrated civilization at some point of time, which is about 3000 BC. Now that is the story of Moses. 
who comes from Egypt to Israel. There was no Israel there, but there was an ancient city of Ur, Usalam, which later came to be known as Jerusalem. So the even the name of Jerusalem comes from Ur, Ur hyphen Salam, Ur U Salam. So that is that is Jerusalem, Jerusalem. OK, so I am moving on to the next slide. You confirm. OK. That when, when you can see the change in slide. So, to me to ask the Kathabula Kaurami, we use Kathabachi. It's there, sir. Okay, so now it has come. So, this is a timeline. So, this is a pretty important slide. Some of you who are interested, I think the assignment we are going to do is based on this. So you can see the various, uh, you can see the various evidences of the very early period prior to 4000 BCE. So this should be all BCE before common era. So that's called the Ubayid period, and that gives rise to the Sumerian period, the Sumerian Akkadian period, and that gives rise to the Mesopotamian period. And then finally, we come to the end of this period, which is Babylonian. And then we come to the Christian and the Islamic times. So on the top right, you can see the red dots, which is a very old civilization of Mesopotamia, which is known as the Jerimo or Jarmo culture, where pottery Neolithic culture from about 7000 millennium was discovered. And then it gave birth to the Halaf culture, in the northwest, the Samara culture in central Mesopotamia, and then the Ubaid culture in the southeast, which later expanded to encompass the whole village, whole region, whole region. So this is actually the backdrop history of entire Sumerian, uh, Akkadian, and Mesopotamian. You know, Akkadian is actually the name of the language, Akkad, Agadi, A G A D E, Agadi, Agadi. So it is from the word Agadi, which was actually a way of life. It is actually the basis of a certain Mesopotamian medicine. Uh, and the word is somehow related to Sanskrit. And, uh, and today we call that medicine Unani. Uh, the word Unani actually comes from the word Ionian, which is a Greek word, which starts, stands for Persian Greek medicine. You know, The word Agadi comes from a very ancient word called toxicology. That means if you have a if you have a certain uh, toxic in your body, you can destroy that toxic by using another toxic. So agad, gad means toxic and agadi means antitoxic. So these are the foundations of many ancient school of medical knowledge like uh, Ayurveda, Unani, homeopathy, Siddha, you know Ayush is ministry's uh, latest department. They are looking after this ancient traditional knowledge system. So if you look at it from the health point of view through medicine, medicinal practices in Indian civilization, Sumerian civilization and uh, uh, Western Asian civilization almost shared a common origin, almost shared a common origin. This is a very, very interesting point to be remembered, but I have just told you or shared with you a tip of the iceberg. The bigger story is much, much bigger, the much, much bigger, which we cannot discuss in a class like this. But I've just given you a little idea. So with this, uh, I move on to the next slide. But before I do that, you can see the pottery, which was so advanced. So even today, uh, Shivangi will buy a pottery like this in Patna, you know, to keep water. So these are fundamental shapes in geometry which are about 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 years old. Even today, such a shape has not in, has changed. In Bengal, uh, this kind of thing is known as Kalashi, which comes from the word Kalash or a class, Ecclesia. You know, so this is how we store water in a pitcher. And they are mud pitchers built out of terracotta and they have thermodynamic properties. So in summer, the water is cool. In winter, the water is hot. So this kind of built form, passive architectural knowledge 
was prevalent and from pottery to architecture, the same passive architecture knowledge was prevalent. Now, this kind of work was practiced in Auroville, which Shivangi knows to a very large extent, which Shivangi knows to a pretty large extent. OK, so I'm moving on to the next slide. Tell me when it's visible. Hello. Yes, sir. It's visible. Yes, sir. OK, so this is about a, a, a more detailed descriptions about Ubaid period. I'm not reading everything. So on the right hand side, you have descriptions of indicators of civilization, um, which are sub components of a build form. Like in a city, you will find many build forms or houses and inside a house, you'll find several potteries, okay. several potteries. OK. So. So this is something which is very, very important to understand. And uh, and and the Ubaid period has actually showed very interesting potteries which flourished in this in this time and uh, potteries were also very rich in in this valley civilization and that is something of a point to be to be remembered to be remembered okay let's move on to the next slide and you tell me when you can see this Hello. Sir, we are still on the Ubaid period slide. Oh. Not yet. Sir, now it's. The slide has changed. Sir. Ubaid phase. Has yes, it sir. come? Yes, sir. Can, yes, you sir. Line, can you read the top line on the left? Can you read the top line on the left? Irrigation canals. Uh, irrigation canals and infiltrations. So these knowledges were very important. I mean, the flood plains and the water re being retained and the productions and settlement systems which is trade and commerce and the network of settlements and inter-trade zones. And the evolution of metal industries, metallurgical industries and art based industries, which is pottery. So this is the overall thing. The picture that you see in the bottom left, that is an unicorn cell of Indus Valley civilization. And the picture that you see on the top right is the Ishtar gate of Mesopotamia, where you find uh, unicorn kind of where you kind where you find unicorn kind of structures unicorn kind of images and in the ancient uh, and in the ancient uh, uh, city of kish you can locate kish somewhere here the kish is right in the center between the it is between marad and kidnoon if you can read the map so in kish they found out a lot of seals from Indus Valley civilization. They found out a lot of seals from the Indus Valley civilization, which showed that ancient Mesopotamian civilization had very vigorous trade with Indus Valley civilization from a very ancient point of time. From a very ancient point of time. So that's about the Ubaid phase, and it gives us a proof of trade relationship with civilizations in the East, which is Indus Valley civilizations civilizations in the west which is greek egyptian and other civilizations so with this we move on to the next slide transition to sumerian phase tell me when you can see this slide it's there sir. okay so this is about the very early early culture and right in the early forms i think shivangi will remember from our uh, wonderful work, which we could do with students and scholars, you know, swastika, shivangi, swastika. Yeah. Yes. Sir. So, so on the top right, you see the Indus Valley swastika. On the bottom right, you can see the Mesopotamian swastika, the Mesopotamian swastika. 
so the swastika was pre, pre, was predominant in both the civilization this is something which is very very interesting and this is actually a samara bowl from where the swastika has been discovered and these are some of the text that you can read that this akkadian word sumeru actually comes from the ancient sanskrit word sumer and uh, and uh, the sumerian uh, kanjur the land of civilization kings also matches with tibetan and indian words you know kanjuri or kanjur you know or kanji kanji in japan korea and uh, and even in dravidian south we have kanji varam and and tanji which is tanji varam kind of different art styles so these there could have been a very strong south indian connection so that talks about the elamo which is persian and dravidian a sumerian dravidian language now this early language of mesopotamia or sumeria was non semitic so this was a language which existed prior to the beginning of judaism this was a language so this is a point to be remembered after that the semitic speaking people slowly entered and then the quality of the civilization and the approach totally changed it totally changed so this is in brief all about the sumerian civilization i move on to the next slide sumerian city of eridu do you tell me when you can see this slide i think we are losing a bit of time in all this sumerian city of eridu yes sir is there yeah so in the sumerian city of eridu uh, there were lots of gods and goddesses which 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 were worshiped so some of the first early complex structures were the temple uh, structures and uh, and the governor was known as angshi or angshu and the king was known as lugal it is from this word the word legal has come the legal and and the and the kingship was known as pala which is a indian sanskrit word you know like nagar pala dar pala khetra pala and it is also very intimately connected with the greek word polis like metropolis ecumenopolis neopolis which means the city a governance so these are words which connect civilization from india to sumeria to greece at a very ancient point of time and it it is from the word pala or palan palan which means to nurture and cultivate the word planning has emerged you know planning planning it has emerged from there you know shivangi is a planner i am also supposed to be a planner and things like that so which means this civilizations of sumeria the city of eridu developed a very complex uh, matured form of civilization let's move on to the next slide the inner message and the epic tell me when you can see this light is there sir okay so this is uh, one of the earliest civilizational structures which is you can see the ziggurat which was built in steps and you can see a range of steps going from the ground level to a very high level and you can see similar structures even in mesoamerica with the mayan pyramids or the inca pyramids so there's a striking similarity of the way people have built structures in asia and also in mesoamerica not almost at the same time but almost at the at the same half of ancient civilization so in this ruins in these archaeological ruins uh one of the earliest literatures from from sumerian civilization was discovered which is the epic of gilgamesh is there anyone in the class who has heard about the epic of gilgamesh anyone in the class anyone in the class anyone in the class okay no one hello am i audible yes sir yes sir you are yeah. so in in the in the epic of gilgamesh there's a lot of descriptions about gods and especially goddesses which showed that the sumerian civilization was predominantly a matriarchal society with lot of goddesses as the most important thing and there's a direct mention 
of the seven sages, the Saptarishis, which is there as, as a part of the Sumerian literature. Now, this is a very powerful evidence, and I, and I give you a reference from Stanford University Press book. And even the book by Vikramaditya Prakash and Francis Dickaching on the global history of architecture refers this. So this is a very, very important. This is a very, very important uh, element of similarity between Sumerian and Mesopotamian civilization. So this is extremely interesting. And this is a structure which is built in steps. And this is pyramidal. And this is having a larger base. And of course, a very a tapered apex right on the top. So the structural symmetry and the geometrical balance of the structure and, uh, and, the, and the journey from the lowest level to the highest level is all maintained, is all maintained. So obviously at the topmost level, it's, it, it's expected to be the highest level, you know, like the citadel of Indus Valley civilization or if you go to Acropolis in Athens. So the geometrical height of a of a building or a mound or a place is supposed to be more divine because it's closer to the sky. So these kind of symbolic elements of design in Sumerian architecture are very universal recurring thoughts or elements of design that we need to understand. Let's move on to the next slide. So the temple of Eridu. Next slide. I've changed the slide. Confirm when you can see this slide. Yes, sir. Yeah, so this is the temple of Eridu, the picture that I showed you right in the beginning. And this is a front view on the top right. In the in the middle right, you can see the plan form, which is asymmetrical. And in the bottom right, you can see a three dimensional section of the how the structure was built. The temple existed about 3000 BCE or even earlier, and it belonged to the famous mother goddess Ishtar. From this word, the word Astar or star or asterisk, you know, the computer symbol of the star has emerged. And if you look at the ancient picture of the mother goddess Ishtar, there's a striking similarity. This question I've asked to many people in many previous classes. So what is the striking similarity? Can anyone say from the class? Hello. Yeah, so what is uh, if you look at this seal of the mother goddess on the bottom left? There is a you see the mother goddess of Sumeria known as Ma Mother Ishtar. But if you look at this seal, you find something that you also see in other countries if you have seen it. So Anyone in the, yes, she is sitting on the line or standing on the line. And she's trying to negotiate with a person on the other side. And she has multiple hands or rays of of sun going all around him. So this kind of a picture that she has has a striking similarity with the kind of mother goddess tradition that we have in India, especially in Eastern India, you know, Ma Durga. I think Shivangi is familiar with it and other people like Bakul and others who are from Eastern India. That is how she is worshipped. How many of you have seen this? Anyone in the class? Ma Durga sitting on the lion and negotiating with the Ashur on the other side. Yes. Yes. OK, so this is a striking similarity. This is a very striking similarity. So the, it, it appears that at a, very, at a very ancient point of time, the mother goddess symbol remained as a common connection between this. So within the architectural space, the built form, there were practice traditions which are very, very interesting. It's a very, very interesting. OK, let's move on to the next slide. But the three points on the top, the urban design asymmetry, the rhythmical buttresses, and the multiple ancillary spaces around the central room with a play of heights. That should be play, P-L-A-Y. I'm sorry, that's a play, spelling mistake. Are very, very important, are very, very important. OK, so these are some of the architectural features. Next slide. Can you all see? 
temple districts at Uruk? Not yet, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, now you can see. Okay, temple. Di so this is the this is the geographical information systems or the GIS plan of different layers of the temple built in different times. A comprising of the courtyard, the court, the building, the hall and everything. So this is actually the temple at Uruk, the Ishtar temple. And you can see that there are different temples which are built in different times. There could be disturbances or there could be different layers of civilizations. And, and this is how the architectural spaces were designed. So different colors uh, portray different layers of history. And in the bottom right, you can see a glimpse of the ancient Sumerians in, in the bottom, bottom right. And if you look at the lowest row, if you look at the lowest row, that is bottom below, you can see that, that the Sumerians, if you look at the headdress of the Sumerians, it's very, very interesting. Like the Egyptians, and like the Indians, the Sumerians were also tonsuring or shaving their heads. They're shaving their heads. And they're, and they're wearing a cloth-like uh, thing around their waist that you still see in South India or you see among the ancient Egyptian pharaohs. So the head dresses, the head rituals, and the dress habits of the Sumerians have a striking similarity with the Egyptians and the Indians. And the Indians. That's something which is very, very interesting. There's a lot of research on this. There's a lot of controversy on, on, on this because if that is true, then you directly connect the Indian culture with the Sumerian culture. Then you get connected with the three religions of the world, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So there is a bit of trouble in this kind of academics, but we know it's true based on these evidences. So let's move on to the next slide. Can you see the slide? Please confirm. Temple at Uruk. Temple at Uruk. Yes, sir. Okay. So this is the temple at Uruk, which is uh, dedicated to the god of Anu, which means the atom, which is also a Sanskrit Sumerian word. And uh, and this is how the temple is built on the raised ziggurat. And this is where the epic of Gilgamesh was probably composed and it's described. And, uh, and it's divided into different sections and chambers, you know, uh, based on different syllabic pronunciations, syllabic pronunciations. So, uh, so this is uh, a very simplified temple at Uruk which became more and more complex as centuries passed, and it became a very complex ziggurat, which I think I have in later slides. Okay, so let's move on. So you can see the Ishtar temple, the next slide. Yes, sir. So this is the archeological ruin of the Ishtar temple, and uh, uh, a lot of portion of the structure has been destroyed. And uh, below in the bottom, you can see the various uh, expressions of the mother goddess Ishtar. So before the male chauvinistic religion that originated like Judaism, Christianity and uh, Islam, in the preceding times, most of the religious culture in Sumeria was predominantly mother goddess based. Mother goddess, you know, like the way we still have in India, like Lalita in the south, Durga and Kali in the east. And, uh, and and other goddesses in the West, you know, especially in East and South India, the mother goddess tradition has remained to be very, very strong. In other parts of India, it's not that strong. Of course, the name of Bombay is also after the mother goddess, Ma Ambai, which means Ambu means ocean. So mother of oceans. So that's why Bombay is known as Mumbai, Mumbai today. You know, She's also known as Juhu or Tara. That's why even even Bombay today we have a road called Juhu Tara Road. So there are a lot of ancient history in India. But anyway, if you come to Sumeria, you find the goddess of Ishtar, and you can see a structure which will be 
which you will be seeing in other parts of the world also, other parts of the world, like when we come to Greece and Cretan civilization, you'll see some of these kind of structures. So they look like pretty organized, fortified, and it's very interesting to see the slab designs of the structures and how the slabs were all hold and composed. So this is about uh, 4,500 years old or even earlier. And this is where she was worshipped and venerated. And uh, this is a glimpse of the temple. If you look at the wall structure, you can see revetments. That means the wall is not homogeneous. It's got revetments you know, that you still do in a boundary wall. For example, if you're building a long boundary wall, you cannot make it straight because in rain and storm, the boundary wall will follow. So you go zigzag, zigzag, zigzag. So the, the wall becomes the wall, the wall or the vertical membrane becomes stronger. So this kind of knowledge was already known to the Assyrians and the Sumerians about 5000 years back or even earlier. So it's evident in the Ishtar goddess temple. You know. So the knowledge of brick building was very, very strong with these people. Let's move on to the next slide. And this is a little uh, uh, colorful slide. Tell me when you can see it. Yes, it's there. So this is where, uh, this is like a simulation. This is like a simulation of ancient Sumeria or Mesopotamia. So you can see on the top right, the distant, uh, the distant uh, ziggurat, and you can see the the, the Sumerian or Mesopotamian you know, kings and governors, and you can see the position of women or the queens, which was very very important at the very ancient point of time, and the Ishtar, uh, Ishtar, which was the name of the ancient mother goddess. Her celebration was mostly around the month of. Uh, late February, March and April. It is the same time when Christianity celebrates the, se the festival of Ishtar, Ishtar. So the word Ishtar is the origin of the word Ishtar. She was known as Ishtar or Ashtoreth or Oyster. So these are not imaginations. These are substantiated and proved by long researches. And the expression of her was like an eight pointed star which is also one of the early stars of Christianity, you know, stars of Christianity. Even Buddhism has an eight pointed will, which we have studied in our pre previous semesters. So you can see, uh, you can see the common recurrence. Even the Nazis, the Germans, Hitler and others use this star later. So bottom left, you can see that, you know, the Nazis. So this is very, very interesting that uh, this is very, very interesting. Uh, that uh, the Sumerian goddess Ishtar even remains in, in our life today. If you look at the black stone of Ishtar on the bottom right, and if you straight look at in the top, you can see the sun and the moon. You know, the, the sun is like a dot in the top and the moon is like a crescent. In Sanskrit, we call it Chandra and Vindu. You know, in the, in the Indian religious symbol of Omkar, right on the top, we have this. If you go to Puri Jagannath temple, if you if you go to various temples in Urissa, and right on the top you'll always see a flag flying. flying. So in that flag you'll find the symbol of a crescent, a moon, and a dot, which is the sun. This is the sun. So these connections are very 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 strong, and they have they are also evident in the Babylonian star of Ishtar. So this is a mostly a way of life, rituals, icons, symbolism, semiotics, and things like that, that we need to understand. Look at the dress code. It's almost of the of the lady. It's almost a sari, but it's it's very rich and glamorous and it's and it's becoming uh, the precursor to the Persian dress, which will finally influence the European dress, especially the Greeks especially the Greeks. So the impact of Persian culture on Greek culture was so much, so strong and so powerful 
that finally the later Greeks became jealous of the Persians. You know, that is the story of Alexander. So he wanted to come down to Asia and destroy Persia because the Greeks finally lost their sovereignty and magnanimity and altruism and they became invaders under the leadership of Alexander. And that is how Greece was also destroyed. That is how and that is how Germany was also destroyed. That is how how the British Kingdom was also destroyed. You know, these are all non Aryan kind of behaviors, aggression, imperialism, militant attitude. You know, and finally you get destroyed. OK, so next slide. Ishtari to the path of the Pistris. Can you see this slide? Yes, sir. Yeah, so these are glimpses of other temple forms. So I'll just spend a little time on the top thing so you can see how the structures were built. So this is a structural drawing of uh, of the building that is built there. So you can see how the foundations were laid layer of layer after layer and how the foundations even had different one wall panels and sedimentary layers for not allowing water to penetrate from bottom to top. So various bituminous star felt layers at various levels was a part of constructional engineering in ancient Sumeria and Assyria. So it shows that the Assyrians and the Sumerians were also master builders and they're very strong at detailing and utilities of maintaining the structure or making the structure waterproof, waterproof by extensive use of bituminous tar and felt. Such knowledge was also known to the Indus Valley people and they were also known to the Assyrian and the Sumerian people. So this is a temple at Nineveh, which is in Ashur in Assyria. You can see a plan from Nietzsche. Most of the structure has been destroyed, so we get about a partial plan of this. I'm moving on to the next slide. Now we come to the Mesopotamian phase, the more symmetrical phase of building, and the society is becoming more complex. Tell me when the slide has changed. Mesopotamian phase. Yes, sir. Yeah. So in the Mesopotamian phase, construction industry was mostly managed by the government, the noble people and the royal people. And uh, and the builders were directly under the control of the kings and the priests, you know, like the Brahmins and the Kshatriyas, you know, the priests and the kings. And the Mesopotamian had a divine art of building the buildings. And uh, they used to call and, and they used to call it so the Mesopotamians regarded the craft of the building as a divine gift taught to the men as listed. And uh, and this is the part of uh, what you call Ishtaka and uh, uh, which is the bricks. This is a bricks which were known in Mesopotamia at this time. And it is from this word Ishtaka, which is also a Sanskrit word. The word Ita has also emerged in India and it is from the word Ishtaka, the Persian word Avishtaka or Avesta has also emerged, which is one of the earliest Persian literature of Prophet Zarathustra. So these are some glimpses. So I'm moving on to the Mesopotamian inventory to the next slide, to the next slide. Can you see the next slide? Yes. Sir. OK, good. So. So this is about this is about a small Mesopotamian inventory and it showed and it looks like there are a lot of evidence that the Mesopotamians knew a lot of knowledge which were their own and they were also knowledge which was uh, regained from other civilizations around the world. So they from so they had Kedarud, which came from the west, which is Lebanon. You know, diorite came from Arabia, and lapis lazuli ivory came from India. 
a lot of terracotta knowledge came from India. And the most important thing is that they developed indigenously a very strong knowledge of uh, making glaze styles, what you call vitrification. That means adding a luster and glass property to, to materials. And finally, in increasing the silica level of vitrification so that from opaque material, you can finally make translucent material. And from translucent material, you can make finally transparent or, or glazed materials. So this kind of vitrified knowledge, this kind of uh, this kind of vitrified knowledge, this kind of vit vitrified knowledge uh, is that was known to the Mesopotamians, was, was known to the Mesopotamians uh, uh, right from day one. And today it has contributed Today it has today it contributes today it contributes a, a lot to the building industries, you know, to the building to the building industries of the world around. Because much of modern architecture is all about glass and steel. Is all about glass and steel. Glass plays a very very important role in interiors, glazing, and arriving at various colors and everything. So this is a famous Ishtar Gate. This is a famous. Uh, Ishtar Gate uh, of uh, Babylonia, where glaze tiles were used extensively and exhaustively. Okay, I'm moving on to the next slide. This is a pretty important slide. Ziggurat of Ur. Tell me when you can see it. Hello. Yes, sir. OK, so this gives you a glimpse of the more formal structures, the more symmetrical structures. So there's a shift from more organic asymmetrical structures of the past to more formal structures of the Mesopotamian times. And as a result of that, the ritualistic portion of Mesopotamian way of life and society increased. And finally, the ziggurats emerged. And finally, the ziggurats have emerged. So this is a ziggurat at Ur, which became pretty large. This is as big as the IIT Kharagpur building, and this is pretty large. And you have actually not seen the IIT Kharagpur building, so when uh, physically, so when you come, you'll actually see it. It's a pretty large building. So the scale and the proportion and the classicity, you know, the classical touch of a different monumental magnam in a magnanimous scale become a way of life of later Sumerian Mesopotamian architecture because the society has become complex and the power class and the power structure has also grown to be a very big thing. So this is a ziggurat of Ur, the plant form on the top right, various artistic renditions in the bottom right or left. And you can see the ruins on top left and the actual structure as it had looked like by an artist in a three dimensional simulation. And you can see uh, how the staircase is going up and, and the ramp forms also. So this is something which is very, very interesting to note and how the people of Mesopotamia had actually built the structures. OK, so let's move on. Ziggurat features. Tell me when you can see this slide. Yes, sir. OK, so I think these are various uh, facts and figures which are which are mentioned. I'm not reading much of there. 65 meters by 100 meters with 21 meters in height. So if three meters is per floor, this is about a seven story high building, about a seven story high building, pretty, pretty, pretty tall. But the second last bullet point, the lowest terrace had a color of white, uh, which belonged to Apsu, one of the goddess primal. The intermediate floors were black and the upper floors were blue that represented the heavens. So that's pretty, pretty interesting how color fundamentals were used to depict different levels of consciousness. 
So these ideas of hierarchy and going up from below, you know, bottom up, is an idea which has remained from Mesopotamian ziggurat to the present form, you know, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yeah, so this is, uh, and Sri Aurobindo's hierarchy of minds. You know. So somehow the geometrical form of hierarchy, pyramidal forms of hierarchy, are fundamental to human 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 thinking, human thought, which gets three dimensional expressions. You know. That's pretty pretty important, and the symmetry of stairs and patterns of pyramidal shapes become pretty universal in all Mesopotamian cities. In all Mesopotamian cities. And moving on to the next slide. And this is also pretty important for one thing. Ziggurat of Ur. Yes, sir. Yeah, so in the Ziggurat of Ur, so this is about 3000 BC. So the Sumerian civilization days are all gone. And the Mesopotamian civilization, the intermediate period is also becoming a little complex. And now the Mesopotamian civilization is about to split. So below bottom left, you can see the early Sumerians, you know, with shaven heads and wearing a dress that you find in Egypt or in India. But later it was taken over by people coming from other portions of Asia. They are the Semitic stock and they are the peoples of Assyria and the bearded people, the bearded people and the bearded tradition becomes more important than the shaven tradition. And that becomes the civilization of Assyria, which continues right right up to the present times of Islamic culture in, and uh, in, in in the ancient Near East, in the ancient Near East. So this is actually a split in culture uh, from Sumerian to Mesopotamian and from Mesopotamian to Babylonian. So this is something that we need to understand. OK, so I think there's a lot of understanding and research that needs to be done. And it will evolve if you go deep into it. OK, and moving on to the next slide. And I think this slide is I can just quickly pass. The slide I showed you last class. Yes, sir. Yeah, so here on the left you can see Sumerian structures and on the right you can see Persepolis that we discussed. Persepolis, of course, was built later, but there's a lot of architectural, cultural and anthropological connection between these two, these two distinct civilizations. So and uh, and they're evident in the next slide. Which I showed you last class also in dealing with the Persepolis platform. That's how the slide reads. I've changed the slide. So this is a palace of Persepolis. Yes, sir. OK, so these are some of the features which you have to remember. They finally get repeated in Roman Empire and uh, early Renaissance architecture like Baroque and Rococo. You know, we'll discuss all those things when we and then you'll remember the slide when we come to that level of discussion. I'm moving on to the next slide, uh, which is not so important. I'm moving on to the uh, almost final slides of Assyrian cities. I think we are coming to the end of the presentation almost in Assyrian cities. Can you see this slide? Yes. Yeah, so this is a glimpse of the upper crown of Sumerian Mesopotamian civilization, which is the Assyrian cities. And the Assyrian cities were built with very high walls and more rigidity and more complex structures and a winged bird uh, symbol that we also have in India, which is called the Garur. You know, the winged bird of India finally becomes a very important element of design or architectural or spiritual element in Assyrian cities. You know. So I think we'll be finishing this class almost by 9.30 because it's taking a lot of strain to speak and uh, you know change the slides. Uh, so, so finally, this he is actually Garur in India. In in Indonesia, he is also known as Garuda. So the Indonesian Airlines 
even today is known as the Garuda Airlines. In Iran, uh, the symbol of Iran is based on the ancient symbol of Zarathustra. So even the ancient symbol of Zarathustra that you see on the top right is actually the symbol of God Ashur in Assyria. And it also becomes a symbol of Ashur, uh, Ashur uh, Zarathustra, which is the ancient symbol of Iran. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that that's, that means from Southeast Asia, through India, through Persia, through Assyria, there was one, one ancient religion that had existed. But then somehow over time, they got separated and they got destroyed. They got separated and the, and the interconnections got destroyed. And then there are a lot of uh, aberrations and dilutions and divergences. So this is actually a very, very enigmatic or mysterious point to be remembered, to be remembered. OK, so it will be very in, in, in important and interesting for you to study the Assyrian cities. So here is a glimpse of the Assyrian cities. I, I'm almost coming to the end of my deliberation. So can you see Assyrian architecture? Yes, sir. Yes. So you can see uh, Assyrians were experts in the way of engineering and they built colossal buildings. Many of the architecture was made out of brick and clay. The, they, they had built forts for military and made homes for families. Villages were also built and kept close. The village, however, was built on the outskirts of the Assyrian Empire, you know, and so, and so and so. So what I'm trying to say is that the Assyrians finally made a very complex order of civilization and they were uh, practicing uh, different kinds of uh, religious performances which had architectural expressions. And they also developed a very complex geopolitical order in the society. And this is an important point to remember. And some of these features, architectural, built form, geopolitical features, finally travels westwards and affects some of the earliest civilizations of Europe, which is the Roman civilizations. So when we come to the Romans, uh, you'll see what we mean by this slide. So please remember this slide for posterity, for a future discussion on the Romans when we come after maybe three or four weeks, after three or four weeks, or maybe a little after that, after the mid-sims, after the mid-sims. Okay, so, so this is the whole glimpse of the origin of Assyrian architecture. Here you can see the winged bird, the Garuda Stambha that you find in Jagannath Temple, in Puri, also in Varanasi, also in Ujjain, and many other places around India. That is also evident in Assyria, which is a winged god of Ashur, Ma, Ashura Maha, Mahadeva, which is Ahura Mazda of ancient Iran. That is also the goddess of Ashur that you see in the extreme left and the extreme right, which is the patron god of Assyria. So this is the origin of Asian, Assyrian architecture. This is a point which has been suppressed, which has been suppressed by, by, by uh, modern scholars to an extent, because these ancient connections create a lot of trouble by linking Asia as one body of civilization. Because the Western forces have always tried to split Asia into parts and create a way of misunderstanding between the countries, which is still going on right now. So it is very important to study history of architecture, the history of culture, the history of built forms and elements, to study about the unity of civilizations that we have lost in the immediate past or distant past, but eventually we'll be able to revive some of these ancient connections. So you can see this slide, the origin of Assyrian architecture, all of you? Yes, sir. Yeah, so these are, this is a very interesting and important slide. Shivangidi knows that uh, I've done a little bit of personal work on this. I have a small Bengali book on this, which is a story book, which is my first book. It's all about this. So that book has become pretty popular and a few thousand copies have been sold. So uh, 
and it's becoming slowly. It's not a question of being becoming popular. It's actually talking about the truth which has been suppressed by some people in the in the intermediate history. OK, so with this. Uh, we come to the very important book. By a German scholar. German scholar Dr. Wash Edward Hale. So here he talks about the Ashura in early Vedic religion because in the in the early portions of the Rig Veda, even Vishnu or Indra or Mitra or Kuna, they are both described as Ashura and also as Ashura, as Ashura. That means gods and Ashura both together. So, but the later Puranic literature, Ashura becomes a symbol of an evil spirit. In Persia, it is just the opposite. Ashura is supposed to be the gods and Shura is supposed to be an evil spirit. So that means that means that there must have been an ancient period when the, where the two religion, where the two regions had shared a common connection. But, and there must have been a later period when a separation and a misunderstanding and a amplitude had grown and the civilizations of India got se separated from the civilizations of the ancient Near East. So this is a very, very important point to be understood. And what you see in the bottom left, bottom left is a is a is the script of ancient Assyria, which is a combination of uh, what you call the chevron or triangular scripts. Now triangle is the symbol of Tantra or Shakti or mother goddess. So it is very, very interesting to see that the Assyrians followed a sacred feminine text, which is the combination of triangles. And in India, we have those Sri Chakra and Star of David in Judaism. So somehow that ancient connection is lost. So with this, so can you all see this slide? Asura in early Vedic religion by Wash Edward Hale. Yep. Yes, yes, sir. OK, OK, so this is, I think, my last slide. So with this, it's almost about 930. So I think from 8 o'clock to 930, we had quite a bit of an exhaustive discussion. So this gives you a glimpse of one of the most intermediate transition links between the, the Central Asian civilization and the other civilizations that we shall discuss from next week onward, hopefully. And on the top, you can see the god Ashur of Assyria which is absolutely a replica of Garu. So this is from the city of Ashur, which is Assyria. This is very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. So you have the Google in your hand and in your free time, you're going to explore. So I'm going to give you some thought experiments on these things because you're a wonderful batch and uh, we can work on this for some time. And so I'll give you some interesting assignments after I finish Egypt and Greece. OK, so thank you. So Shivangi, I'm ending here and. Uh, OK, and OK, uh, okay and uh, if there are any questions I can answer. And uh, otherwise uh, we can call it a day if you have any quick questions. I think this was a pretty simple presentations and and what I just did is just to explain the slides to you. So I think. Uh, it's all fine. It's all fine. So I'm just turning on the video for a while. So thank you very much. Thank you, Swatika, Rithik, Omkar, Somya. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Mubasir.